And if moral courage is not the requisite quality, what could it have been that this stout-hearted slave lacked, this bloody, desperate, kindly-mannered, urbane gentleman, who never hesitated to warn his most ruffinly enemies that he would kill them whenever or wherever he came across them next? I think it is a, a conundrum worth investigating. Chapter 12 a Mormon immigrant train, the heart of the Rocky Mountains, pure salaritus, sal sal a natural ice house, an entire inhabitant, in sight of eternal snow, the South Pass, the parting streams, an unreliable letter carrier, meeting of old friends, a spoiled watermelon, down the mountain, a scene of desolation, lost in the dark, unnecessary advice, U.S. troops and Indians, sublime spectacle, another delusion dispelled among the angels. Just beyond the breakfast station, we overtook a Mormon immigrant train of 33 wagons and tramping wearily along and driving their herd of loose cows were dozens of coarse-clad and sad-looking men, women and children who had walked as they were walking now, day after day for eight lingering weeks, and in that time had compassed the distance our stage had come in eight days and three hours. 798 miles. They were dusty and uncombed, hatless, bonnetless, and ragged, and they did look so tired. After breakfast, we bathed in Horse Creek, a previously limpid, sparkling stream, an unappreciated luxury, for it was very seldom that our furious coach halted long enough for an indulgence of that kind. We changed horses 10 or 12 times in every 24 hours, changed mules rather, six mules, and did it nearly every time in four minutes. <clears throat> it was lively work. As our coach rattled up to each station, six harnessed mules stepped gaily from the stable, and in the twinkling of an eye, almost the old team was out and the new one in, and we off and away again. During the afternoon, we passed Sweetwater Creek, Independence Rock, Devil's Gate, and the Devil's Gap. The latter were wild specimens of rugged scenery and full of interest. We were in the heart of the Rocky Mountains now. And we also passed by Alkali, or Soda Lake, and we woke up to the fact that our journey had stretched a long way across the world when the driver said, that the Mormons often came there from Great Salt Lake City to haul away sal salaritus. He said that a few days gone by they had shoveled up enough pure salaritus from the ground, it was a dry lake, <laughs> to load two wagons. And that when they got the, these two wagon loads of a drug that cost them nothing to Salt Lake, they could sell it for 25 cents a pound. In the night, we sailed by a most notable curiosity, and one we had been hearing a good deal about for a day or two, and were suffering to see. This was what might be called a natural ice house. It was August now, and sweltering weather in the daytime, yet at one of the stations, the men could scrape the soil on the hillside under the lee of a range of boulders, and at a depth of six inches, cut out pure blocks of ice, hard, compactly frozen, and clear as crystal. Toward dawn, we got underway again, and presently, as we sat with raised curtains, enjoying our early morning smoke, and contemplating the first splendor of the rising sun as it swept down the long array of mountain peaks, flushing and gilding crag after crag, and summit after summit, as if the invisible creator reviewed his gray veterans, and they saluted with a smile. 
We hove in sight of South Pass City. The hotel keeper, the postmaster, the blacksmith, the mayor, the constable, the city marshal, and the principal citizen and property holder all came out and greeted us cheerily, and we gave him good day. He gave us a little Indian news and a little Rocky Mountain news, and we gave him some Plains information in return. He then retired to his lonely grandeur, and we climbed on up among the bristling peaks and the ragged clouds. South Pass City consisted of four log cabins, one of which was unfinished. And the gentleman with all those offices and titles was the chiefest of the ten citizens of the place. Think of hotel keeper, postmaster, blacksmith, mayor, constable, city marshal, and principal citizen all condensed into one person and crammed into one skin. <laughs> Bemis said he was a perfect Allen's revolver of dignities. And he said that if he were to die as postmaster or as blacksmith or as postmaster and blacksmith both, the people might stand it. But if he were to die all over, it would be a frightful loss to the community. Two miles beyond South Pass City, we saw for the first time that mysterious marvel called, which all Western untraveled boys have heard of and fully believe in, but are sure to be astounded at when they see it with their own eyes, nevertheless. Banks of snow in dead summer time. We were now far up toward the sky and knew all the time that we must presently encounter lofty summits clad in the eternal snow, which was so commonplace a matter of mention in books. And yet, when I did see it glittering in the sun on stately domes in the distance, and knew the month was August, and that my coat was hanging up because it was too warm to wear it, I was full as much amazed as if I had never had heard of snow in August before. Truly, seeing is believing. And many a man lives a long life through thinking he believes certain universally received and well-established things. And yet never suspects that if he were confronted by those things once, he would discover that he did not really believe them before but only thought he believed them. In a little while, quite a number of peaks swung into view with long claws of glittering snow clasping them, and with here and there in the shade down the mountainside, a little solitary patch of snow looking no larger than a lady's pocket handkerchief, but being in reality as large as a public square. And now at last, we were fairly in the renowned South Pass and whirling gaily along high above the common world. We were perched upon the extreme summit of the great range of the Rocky Mountains toward which we had been climbing, patiently climbing, ceaselessly climbing for days and nights together. And about us was gathered a convention of nature's kings that stood 10, 12, and even 13,000 feet high grand old fellows who would have to stoop to see Mount Washington in the twilight. We were in such an airy elevation above the creeping populations of the earth that now and then, when the obstructing crag stood out of the way, it seemed that we could look around and abroad and contemplate the whole great globe with its dissolving views of mountains, seas, and continents stretching away through the mystery of the summer haze. As a general thing, the pass was more suggestive of a valley than a suspension bridge in the clouds, but it strongly suggested the latter at one spot. At that place, the upper third of one or two majestic purple domes projected above our level on either hand and gave us a sense of a hidden great deep of mountains and plains and valleys down about their bases, which we fancied we might see if we could step to the edge and look over. These sultans of the fastnesses were turbaned with tumbled volumes of cloud, which shredded away from time to time and drifted off, fringed and torn, 
trailing their continents of shadow after them, and catching presently on an intercepting peak, wrapped it about and brooded there, then treaded away again and left the purple peak as they had left the purple domes, downy and white with new laid snow. In passing, these monstrous rags of cloud hung low and swept along right over the spectator's head, slinging their tatters so nearly in his face that his impulse was to shrink when they came closest. In the one place I speak of one of, in the one place I speak of, one could look below him upon a world of diminishing crags and canyons leading down, down, and away to a vague plain with a thread in it which was a road and bunches of feathers in it which were trees, a pretty picture sleeping in the sunlight, but with a darkness stealing over it and glooming its features deeper and deeper under the frown of a coming storm. And then, while no film or shadow marred the noon brightness of his high perch, he could watch the tempest break forth down there and see the lightnings leap from crag to crag and the sheeted rain drive along the canyon sides and hear the thunders peal and crash and roar. We had this spectacle, a familiar one to many, but to us, a novelty. We bowled along cheerily, and presently, at the very summit, though it had been all summit to us, and all equally level for half an hour or more, we came to a spring which spent its water through two outlets and sent it in opposite directions. The conductor said that one of the, those streams which we were looking at was just starting on a journey westward to the Gulf of California and the Pacific Ocean through hundreds and even thousands of miles of desert solitudes. He said that the other was just leaving its home among the snowy peaks on a similar journey eastward, and we knew that long after we should have forgotten the simple rivulet, it would still be plodding its patient way down the mountainsides and canyon beds and p between the banks of the Yellowstone and by and by would join the broad Missouri and flow through unknown plains and deserts and unvisited wildernesses, and add a long and troubled pilgrimage among snags and wrecks and sandbars, and enter the Mississippi, touch the wharves of St. Louis, and still drift on, traversing shoals and rocky channels, and endless chains of bottomless and ample bends, walled with unbroken forests, then mysterious byways and secret passages among woody islands, then the chained bends again, bordered with wide levels of shining sugar cane in place of the somber forest, then by New Orleans, and still other chains of beds, of bends, and finally after two long months of daily and nightly harassment, excitement, enjoyment, adventure, and awful peril of parched throats. Pumps and evaporation pass the gulf and enter, enter into its rest upon the bosom of the tropic sea never to look upon its snowy peaks again or regret them. I frightened a leaf with a mental message for the friends at home and dropped it in the stream, but I put no stamp on it and it was held for postage somewhere. On the summit, we overtook an immigrant train of many wagons, many men and women, and many a disgusted sheep and cow. In the woefully dusty horseman in charge of the expedition, I recognized John Blank. Of all persons in the world to meet on top of the Rocky Mountains, thousands of miles from home, he was the last one I should have looked for. We were schoolboys together and warm friends for years, but a boyish prank of mine had disrupt, disrupted this friendship, and it had never been renewed. The act of which I speak was this. I had been accustomed to visit, occasionally, an editor whose room was in the third story of a building and overlooked the street. One day this editor gave me a watermelon, which I made preparations to, to devour on the spot, but chancing to look out of the window, I saw John standing directly under it, and an irresistible desire came upon me to drop the melon on his head, 